before we bring Garth on, we want to show off these jerseys that we made. So we, we actually got women's jerseys and men's jerseys. Oh. Uh, so come on out. This is uh, Beth Mantle and Tim Foss modern, modeling for us. And so if you are interested in uh, ordering one of these, they are uh, customizable with number, numbers and names. Uh, 60 bucks for the, uh, for the uh, customized version, $55 for the uncustomized version. Uh, there's a whole, if you go onto the, the ordering form, there's a whole sizing chart. And, uh, I, and so the, where you can go if you want to check these out, it is uh, bit.ly YC Jersey Men or uh, YC Jersey Women. If you're interested, uh, settle up with the, uh, with the merch table. And uh, yeah, with that. So we're not, Garth is apparently busy, so we're gonna give him a couple more minutes, and we'll be right back. No, he's right here! That's good, thank you. Does, that, does that mean I'm here? You, you, can, be, you can be right there. All right. We gotta get this, this, I don't know if I'm gonna be as handsome as that guy, though. No, it's that's tough. A, that's a tough bar. All right. Well, Garth, thank you for doing this. I think is this is this year four, year three. I have been here since day one, Jeremiah Yakon style. Yeah, you've been. I, I've broken eggs. I have. Uh, <coughs> that's right. You broke it's eggs. From a planning perspective, if that's accurate, I, I, I'm more of a freeloader on, on Yakon, but but yes, I've I've appeared. It's been well. I really appreciate you doing this again. It's fun, man. We have a good time every time. I hope so. Your outfit gets better every year, too. Right? I mean, this is, this is extraordinary. Good. I'm, I I'm mean, so you glad. look skinny, too, doesn't he? Like, like you got a diet, and then he dress up. I mean, it's a big night. Hey, hey, look at that. We, got, we had smoke. That was smoke. The smoke? That was smoke. You can't use it in the stadium, right? So you got you may as well spread your bullets here. Bail sales. Right, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be the man. So, uh, I, I just don't get to drink like you guys do, so I gotta fake it up there a little bit. <laughs> this is this is Everclear. I, it, yeah, this is the latest I've been up in like three months. I I, 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 I hope so I stay awake. I have a cup of coffee in my car. <laughs> Did you put the kids to bed before you got here? They they I, I put them in their in beds. Bed. As you know, as a fellow father, that, yes. that didn't mean that they went to bed. That they they were. I was at least able to check the box for my wife to say. See, honey, I was here to help. Right. And, and, I, and I very respectfully scheduled the yacht on appearance after bedtime. Yes. Uh, but I suspect she might interpret my actions differently tomorrow morning, uh, depending <laughs> on how well everyone sleeps and, and, and gets through the night. But that's such as, you know, that's, that's fatherhood. Yes, I, I know quite well. Uh, <laughs> for sure, yes. Um, so I wanted to start with a, a little bit of a, a personal anecdote. Um, before MLS Cup, you, we were doing a, a media scrum, and I, I asked you uh, if that had potential to be transformative, and you gave me a long, winding answer about <laughs> transformers. Do, do I give any other kind? Yeah, but it was about, I think you actually said Optimus Prime in your answer. That was uh, dumb. Uh, it's, not, it's not my finest work. But I liked where you were going. I, I appreciate right, where you were going. Well, you were gonna try to save me. This, this yeah. is, I'm gonna appreciate you. Right, but that said, I, uh, you know, I, I can understand where you were coming from. I think you were trying to not put the cart before the horse and all that said. Now that you sit here, you know, a couple months after winning MLS Cup at home, does it feel like that was a, like how big of a, of a deal was that really? Like when you, when you sit here now and you look at the, the way that it affected everything? I, look, it was the best sporting moment of my life. Um, it was, it was, I, I guess I'm not, I'm just cautious about saying transformative, but what I'll give you some data points. I think that's fair. Um, we sold more season tickets the week after MLS Cup than we had the previous year. The week after that, we sold more than we had the previous year. So, like, that is amazing. Oh, no, thank you all. I mean, you know, and when you speak to things being transformative, it's if you carry that momentum into a full season, uh, and with the commensurate in uptick in team performance and fan participation and you know all the stuff that, that we've all been pretty good at here in Seattle for a while, 
then that might be. You know, but I'm just cautious that, I, that I, what, I, what makes me nervous, I guess, is still what I don't want is everybody to show up on Thursday or Sunday or both and be like, oh, there's not 70,000 people here, so then it wasn't transformative. Like, you know, but because that's not how this stuff works. It's, it's everybody gets a little bit more enthusiastic and everybody brings a friend and everybody says, I'm going to go to two games in February, even though it's maybe cold and a little bit rainy and we're all going to show up. And, you know, with respect to Thursday, for example, when you talk about these Champions League games in the season ticket package, everybody knows we're playing Thursday, but some people show up and some, some people don't. And this is a real game. I mean, this is, this is a knockout game. There, there's you know, seven figures at stake in terms of revenue and moving on, and we got a draw that allows us to potentially become the first team ever to win Champions League as, as an American club. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, all, most of the folks here have families, and then it's, you know, it's a, it's a pain in the neck to go out Thursday night and stay up late on a school night and get your kids out and then come back on Sunday and do it again. So. Uh, but we would really—it's it's one of the biggest weeks of the season. We feel like for us, we, we have to win our, our league games in addition to our Champions League games because the schedule—the easiest section of the schedule—is uh, in this first third of the season. We open with six and nine at home, so there's a ton of pressure on us right now, um, and I mean that in a good way. I mean because I think we want to—we want to go back to your original question. We want to make good on this opportunity. We we have this, you know, hopefully not once in a lifetime moment. But that said. 10,000 people on the March to the Match and a Macklemore concert and the call and response on your way into the building, uh, followed by the pandemonium there. And I was just talking about this uh, on, on Jackson's show on KJR. The thing that I have, I, I save the game, right? And I obviously didn't get to watch the TV broadcast from your stadium. But the part that I do is I fast forward to the goals. And then they show the crowd reaction. And like, just the pandemonium, like like people literally swimming over each other. I mean, it looks like a mosh pit rock show. And like, that's amazing. Like, if you can capture, like, I was there for that. We were there. We all were there for that, right? That was... And that's amazing. And that part can be transformative because that's the shared experience that is really hard to replicate. And look, we're going to try to do it again. So, I, I want to say we had another conversation that was right after the draw for Champions League. And, you, and the, the offseason got off to a little bit of a slow start, I would say. Um, and one of the things you mentioned to me is that we might have to wait until it's uncomfortable to make some signings. Did it get to that? I think all of us probably got to that point. Did you actually, <laughs> did you actually get to that point? My wife says this to me about once a week. You know, like, you think now's the time for the diet? You know, I think it's, it's <laughs> uncomfortable enough yet. Um, uh, it... I don't know, man. I've been doing this a long time, and you got to you got to make the right you got to get the right deal. And and so when the stress comes and you're second guessing yourself, when you're when the fear of failure starts to bubble up, sometimes you just gotta tell it to back off and uh, come back to we're the defending champs. We've been to three of the last four MLS Cups, and you don't say that arrogantly. But thank all of you again. Not you know. We don't say this enough, but I mean, this is not possible without the support here. Seattle is not the size city that would support a payroll normally to be able to compete with the players that we're able to acquire. And I look a heck of a lot smarter with 40,000 people in the building and Ladera with Rui Diaz on the field than I do when there's 15,000 in the building. So trust me, I don't, I don't succeed without you guys. So now that you, the, the roster is pretty close to set, I. I think that's fair, probably fair to say, right? Do you do you feel like extra we're, we're of money? So in that sense, it's, it's well, there. You go. Uh, yeah, it's kind of sad. I, we don't get an allowance of this either. We got to kind of wait for like the next CBA or something like that to, to save up. So do you? I mean, do you feel like you you like? Are you comfortable with it? Do you feel like exercising patience was really the right way to go about this? Especially maybe after the CBA didn't turn out how a lot of people might have predicted it would. Um, I mean, look. At some level, you just have to make a piece with it because it is what it is, right? I mean, we, we spent the money and the CBA came back, and you know, everyone asked me how I feel about CBA, and I'm like, you know, it's how I feel about the DMV. I mean, like, you know, they make the rules, and you know, turns out I have to follow them. So, uh, you know, and I can try to, you know, bump up against the guardrails here and there and try to, you know, test the boundaries sometimes, but if you go too far, you're going to get in trouble, and we don't want to do that. And, you know, again, I, I, I think our operating thing just in this offseason, it's been, it's been a really tumultuous offseason 
off the field for us because when you don't have a CBA coming in and you don't know the rules, you got to have two or three different plans because you have to have two or three different budgets. And then it lands two weeks before the season starts and then you have to execute everything in, in two weeks. So, um, you know, and literally how we structure these deals has to be tweaked depending on how much money we have and how much we don't. Without getting in the weeds too much, you, you can move money from one year to the next, but you have to have this three-year plan always as to how you're going to use your money overall. So um, it was tighter than maybe we had hoped, uh, but we feel like we have a good team. I think we've replaced the capabilities, at least, of the folks that left, um, and I think that we have a very, very good team. I think, like any team, we got to get fit. we got to play some games together. we got to you know create that chemistry. It's a new center back pairing. It's a new... Defensive midfielder pairing. We're without Gustav and Nico right now, like, and that's all okay. Like, like, I hope hopefully that's enough to get by Thursday by Olympia. Still going to be a good team. It's going to be a very tough game, um, but if we can get off to a good start, honestly, as we've talked about, kind of ad nauseum at this point, this is also an opportunity for some of our young players to come in and step up. And, and you know, we saw some perf good performances from young players already on the road at Olympia. I mean, if you think think of what you were doing at 16 years old. And then think about Danny Labor playing in Honduras. <laughs> it, it's not. It doesn't suck. It, no, it's 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 it's. He, and I think he acquitted himself well. I thought he was real good. Yeah. Uh, so as a former player who played during a very different economic time, I think it's fair to say in terms of the way that the league was structured. Do you look at the CBA now and and kind of marvel at the? Uh, the advancements that really ended up getting, that have been made at this point? So uh, I frame this, uh, in the, in, as I do most things in the context of our relationship, but I think my wife believes that I was a professional athlete, but she maintains that there's certainly no visual proof that that, that, that was ever the case. So when I talk to her about my career, and she's like, okay, show me, and I'm like, well, I have this VHS tape. And she's like, well, but that doesn't, you know, we don't have a VCR, let alone, you know, what are you, what are you doing with me? Uh, and I'm like, well, Google me. You can do it on the internet. She's like, oh, you mean those horrible braids you had? That right. no That's like the play. one picture. No one would play with those. Like, you can, it would be very impractical. Like, it wouldn't, anyway. The, it was a different time. Um, you know, uh, uh, journalists have, have gotten on this idea, this 25th anniversary of MLS, they're collecting some of the stories from the, from the first year. And uh, it was my second year in Dallas, so just a fun little story real quick is, we, we were in a double wide trailer, and I'm not exaggerating, it wasn't an RV, it was a double wide trailer. It was parked in the uh, parking lot of a private uh, middle school called Green Hill, and we had to train every day before recess because the kids didn't want to get up there with the, with the men, there was liability issues, and we had to do that. So, uh, and, and at one point that season it was over 100 degrees for 42 days in a row. And needless to say, they didn't have irrigation uh, systems or, or, or sprinkler systems for the private school. Um, and to top everything off, uh, the mascot was a peacock, and it, it was a rich private school in Dallas, so they had an actual peacock. <laughs> like with big blue feathers, and as you left the double wide, most of the kids weren't coming out of trailers onto the school grounds. And so it always freaked the peacock out. So we would be coming in, 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 into practice, and like literally, we, did, we had a laundry room in there, we had the training room in there, like we had the showers like you have like in a camping site. Um, and if we really got in trouble, we, there were flake, the, the, the panels on the wall were all fake, so you could pop them out, throw the equipment manager over the wall, get in the coach's office, just figure out who was gonna start the next day, and then the other guys would go off party. Uh, <laughs> kinda, mostly true. I never did it, of course. Uh, anyway, that's where we started, and we kinda got paid commensurate with Ducking peacocks and, and uh, you know predicting coach lineups and uh, you know we didn't have I didn't have a goalkeeper coach I played five years in the league I never had a goalkeeper coach we didn't have any sports we didn't have any strength and conditioning we didn't but yeah charter list. flights I assume <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh, yeah the charter charter flights are it's a sign of growth it's, it's uh, for those who don't know they are incredibly expensive. Um, and so it's, it's, it's something that changes the economics of the league, but it, look, it's a, it's a step forward overall. Obviously, we want to treat our guys as well as we can, and um, you know, getting them back from Honduras, for example, via charter, real benefit to hopefully getting everybody another night in their beds and, and getting everybody better rested for Thursday. So, so if I'm correct, Wade Weber was one of your teammates in he Dallas. He was, twice. Right? 
in, in Dallas and in Miami. Two time. Yeah. And so Dave Clark's going to be upset if I don't ask you about this. <laughs> you're a, you're a, oh. Oh, wow. Look at that is, baby face. That is. You know, you know what hurt my feelings the other day? And he's, that's, yeah, that's me at 20, yeah, it's, I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm not I, sure I, I can turns out at 25, I look younger than now. That's, yeah. that's the point. <laughs> so what hurt my feelings was my, my two-year-old came up to me at dinner the other day, and, and he's a little blonde-headed, uh, we're Dutch ancestry, so that all the kids come out blonde and their hair turns colors darker after that. Uh, and he comes up to me and he touches my head and he said, Daddy has a big silver head. And uh, that was, uh, there's, he's going to put it up on the screen for you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so anyway, when I look at this, I'm like, oh, it wasn't always, it wasn't, it's not that color no. anymore. No, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a good looking fella. Thank you. Thank like you. A, that jawline is impressive. I guess, yeah, you sharp chin, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. But uh, the reason without, I, without a fitness coach. Well, so Mickey wanted to ask you about this picture. Do you, have, do you actually have the question? Mickey is a... This looks official, by the way. Like, I don't want to mess I know. this up. And somebody that's got a Dallas Burn logo. Huh? Yeah, where, where did this come from? Mickey's, Mickey's baby? eBay. eBay. Nice. All right, all right. Oh, Mickey made it. Okay, that, that's more believable. Because okay. we actually, believe it, or, believe it or not, we actually had playing cards for the Dallas Burn. Like, when we would hand them out in, in the fields, because no one was going to buy them in store, so we would actually hand them out. Um, anyway, this, we're going down some dark alleys. That's okay. I, the reason I brought up Wade Webber, though, is my understanding is you guys were in a Dungeons & Dragons game we, together. We worked out. Uh, Wade was a dungeon master. Um, and and uh, probably more nefarious than that is I used to babysit Wade's children because we made $24,000 a year and, you know, if we could pick up a couple bucks to uh, take him to, to the carnival or whatever, we were doing that, you know, every, every weekend. So, um, no, we, we did it. We had fun. And, and uh, the other guy in the group, well, there's, there's two other guys, uh, a gentleman named Brett, who's, who's a very smart guy who was kind of a ninja and, and had a safe full of weapons that I kind of didn't really want to... Like in real life? Yeah. That, ah. that I didn't really want to tackle. But he could fix, he could fix any car. Uh -huh. And I was driving a 19... Gosh, 1990 Toyota, Toyota Corolla that I bought before... I think maybe right... I think it was my, I think it was my first car. So anyway, it was, had 200,000 miles on it. So Brett was important in my life because he kept that thing on the road. Uh, and then Rich Ferrer was the other guy in the group. You guys don't know who any of these people are, but Rich Ferrer was the, the captain of, of at Dallas Burn at the time, and is now a federal judge in, in Austin. So, in, in, I think technically in San Antonio, but um, there's literally like, I think, three of us that went on and became lawyers, and it's me and Rich, and there's one other guy, uh, not Hesmer, it's another goalkeeper. Anyway, it's so uh, our D and D group had had a lot of people who thought they were smart. I yeah, <laughs> that's usually. I think that's how D and D. I don't know a lot. Is that of how it works? I think it's how it works. Yeah. But um, so I, I guess a lot. I'll I'll go. I'll I'll, I'll take this path here. Uh, not a soccer question, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing that you were into some nerdy stuff. I, I was. I, as my wife says again, I'm the user. I, I was a loser. Do you uh, do you ever marvel at how, for lack of a, like, pardon the pun, marvel at how these things have now become like the biggest franchises in the world? I mean, look, I moved to Seattle, and Wizards of the Coast is based here. Right? Like, you know, never, you know. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and, and, and look, I think the world's become a more inclusive place and a more accepting place, and so these things that you had to find literally three people in the state of Texas who you could do who wouldn't laugh at you, like, that's different now than, than I think how, how kids grow up, and that's a, and that's a great thing. Oh, I, a, a little cheer there. Yeah. So we'll, we'll turn it back to, to soccer. I just, I was curious about that. It's, um... it, it is, you know what, I, I've, I've been trying to weigh whether or not to, my, my oldest one is eight, my oldest boy is eight, and like, when to introduce him? Any, any, there's a crowd of any suggestions? Yeah. Eight years old? Yeah. All right. All right, because we've done Star Wars, and that was kind of was too scary for the five-year-old, but it all came with the eight-year-old. But anyway, he's not as into the fantasy stuff, though. I've been trying to introduce him a little, like a Dragonlance book here. Or... Well, the you, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not the hard part, though, right? I mean, it's... Getting the... I, can, I can read the books and roll the dice for him, right? I mean, that's... Sounds like I need to take a little more responsibility. There. I That's guess so. Thank you, sir. All right. 
All right, so one of the, the, the more interesting things I think about the, the CBA, and I guess maybe this is nerd talk, uh, but a different kind, uh, is this clause that allows for a bunch of under, like 22 and under players to be signed uh, that have, that I guess their transfer fees don't hit the cap at all? Is that my, is that the correct that, understanding? That, that is, and I want to be careful here just because my, I believe that this has been discussed and suggested, uh, but I don't know if the board has formally approved okay. this yet or not. Um, but basically it's the idea of if you sign younger designated players, those guys are assets. They're, they are guys that we're going to develop and resell, and so for the economics of MLS, instead of bringing in Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and, and honestly, like, I think that was a good signing. I mean, it was, it was very exciting for the league, the Wayne Rooney and stuff, but balance that by also bringing in younger DBs um, that kind of make their name for us and then build up MLS as a place where people want to come to launch their own career because they see you can start here and make a lot of money. And then over time, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's almost like a, I don't know whether it's a step forwards or sideways or whatever it is, but, but it's, it's a very long-term play, you know, to say we're going to bring in these younger players and we're going to nurture them, develop them, and eventually the whole enterprise is going to be moved forward because you can sign Zlatan and he can score three goals in the opener and you're like, okay, that, that, that's exciting. <coughs> Excuse me, I've just been sick for the winter. Um, and it's, uh, anyway, this is, this is more about how do you build a team, how do you do this? The good news for us is I think it's consistent with our philosophy. Um, the thing I would say is that we are we are going to be careful, assuming this goes forward in some form or fashion, we're going to be careful not to stifle what we have here. We've spent a lot of time and energy and money on developing our players. Um, and so I think we'll be we'll be somewhat cautious in terms of how we approach this and you know to try to make uh, hopefully I would say that we would lean toward, you know, let's say three slots come in. I think we would probably lean toward one higher impact signing than three smaller impact. And don't hold me to that because we're, we're still walking through it, but I think that's the, the approach we'll take. Because the other thing you've got to be really cautious about here is international spots. They're already at a premium. They're selling for 250 300 a pop. Um, and if you have three DPs and three young DPs, that's, that means there's no more tan That means you've gutted the, the, the middle sure. of your team. That's sure. six of your eight foreign spots that are used. Um, and you only got them two guys in that kind of uh, what's what will now be between 1.7 and sorry 700 and 1.7 for that damn thing. So. And you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> All right. All right. So on that kind of this, that same uh, line of thinking, uh, the defiance of that, you know they're going into uh, this is I think year five of the U of the Sounders having the USL team. Is that right? Year six. Six. Year I think, six. Yeah, we started 15. Okay, so how are you feeling about where that, like, that trajectory is? Are you feeling good about Defiance and where it fits in and everything? Um, I am overall, and, and again, I know we haven't made the linear progress that I think we all hope for, um, but our choice last year was really to go too old or too young. And what I meant by that is, what I mean by that is, we knew if we went with all our prospects that we were probably going to get our tails kicked sometimes. Um, and the beginning of the season started off not well and not competitively, and that was the worst possible, worst case scenario. And we really suffered from having a young goalkeeper and young center backs, and that's a particularly tough combination. Um, so the good news is, is the young center backs and the young goalkeeper got a lot better as a result of that, but that meant that this team really struggled and I think lost a little bit of belief in itself after they lost games three nothing, four nothing, five nothing, lose seven of eight, lose eight of 10, that kind of thing. And so we said, we really want to stabilize the team for this year, where we still want to give those kids minutes, we still want to develop them, but we invested in a 31-year-old center back and uh, some experience in defensive midfield. And a local? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah Taylor, who's, yeah, yeah, who's, who's come home and, and uh, you know, a la Wade Weber returned, and uh, I guess slightly before Wade, uh, Wade did from May's perspective. But if you have somebody like Justin Dillon, if he's not playing for the first team, and he's your center striker, and he has experience, he scored 10 goals, now, all of a sudden, you look down that spine and you say, good young goalkeeper, Trey Muse, but Steph Cleveland's going to be coming down, and that's going to be more of a battle for, for getting experience and developing those guys. You know, experienced center back, experienced defensive midfielder, experienced, uh, you know, guy uh, come through. Colin Fernandez is another guy we signed that was in the, in those, in the young mid-20s as opposed to being 17. Um, and then we're going to sprinkle the 17 and 18-year-olds around those guys and hopefully have a complement of guys. And, and look, let's be honest. We haven't figured out exactly how to do this yet. 
but it's the thing, it's the last frontier for our club. The first team's okay. Three or four MLS Cups. The, the, the Academy's also pretty okay. Won the national title, first team to win the GA Cup. So this is the mission for us. If you look at all the people we hired, because we had some people, you know, what happens, you win, right? All your good people get recruited. We basically lost our performance department and, and our development department. The guys we brought in are almost all guys, with one exception, two exceptions, that know our culture and have worked here at one point before. So Henry Bronner's come in to replace Mark Nichols. Henry used to scout for us. Um, and you know, we, we've really striven, we, we, we promoted from within, and Gary Lewis became not just a coach, but an, our academy director. Um, and so we, and we hired John Hutchinson, who used to be the defiance coach, to be our full-time development coach. I think these are all breaking news pieces. But. Are they really? Okay. <laughs> There's going to be a press release tomorrow morning, so um, you guys can be like, how do you spell that? Was he drunk? Um, no. Uh, anyway, those guys are all now staffers that we're going to add, and they're all focused, you'll, you'll, you'll hear, on development. And so John Hutchinson's role is really cool in particular because this is something that's all the rage right now in, in England and in Europe or more broadly, um, to have an idea of basically there's a guy whose job it is to take the prospects and to get them ready to be in the first team. So we got the prospects, we got the first team, we haven't yet put the prospects in the first team. And so John's job is gonna be a mix of first team and defiance, and we're gonna form this group called an elite training group, um, and we're gonna bring our best prospects together, and we're gonna have them interact directly with our first team staff. And so we got some really cool creative ideas about how to take this next step to really push these kids forward so we can begin taking advantage of all of the investment and all the time we put in over the five years. So. So I got, I got a couple more questions and then I'm gonna uh, open it up. If anyone has questions they wanna submit, uh, make sure they get it to lick it. But um, before that, uh, I wanted to ask you about your guys' attitude towards analytics. Uh, you've talked a lot about Ravi Ramini. Is anybody yep. saying that right? Yep. Uh, and he has been, uh, he, he's, he seems to have done a lot of great work for you guys. Uh, and I'm, but I am curious, like when you're weighing decisions, and I don't know if you've ever had a situation where the analytics side maybe disagreed vehemently with the scouting side or vice versa. Do you, like, does that just like X, if, if there is that disagreement, does that X out a, a potential signing? How do you go about managing those kinds of disagreements? Uh, this, is a, this is a great question because, you know, people ask me what I do. Uh, it's a fair question. Because I, I, you know, and I've said this in a number of different forms. Like, I'm a general manager. Literally, I generally manage. I know a little bit about a whole bunch of different things, and a lot of my job is honestly putting that stuff together. And the legal training I have, I think, allows me to identify what are the important parts of the information, and then to distill it down to kind of the key elements, and then dig into those, and then hopefully make your decisions. So this is the essence of what we do. This is the essence of being a GM. You got to take your your because your, your, your analytics guys and your scouts. We want them to have their own opinions, and we want them to be independent opinions, and we want them to have different processes, right? And then you have to take the results of those, and they're definitely gonna conflict. Now, look, it happens like with the Rui Diaz, where you know Chris literally went down to scout, they're like, this guy's pretty good, you know, at the time we could never afford him. He literally he was the leading scorer in Mexico, he scored 15 goals six years in a row. It was like, it was, it was, you know, he didn't have to turn over any rocks. I mean, he was the sunflower blooming, you know, uh, in the meadow and, you know, open in front of all of us. And the coach's like, we should sign him. This guy's the scouts like, we should sign him. And they, I'm like, Robbie, we, we good? And he's like, yes, yeah, this is the best uh, uh, best ratio over expected goals that I've ever seen. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, was that really hard? Because like, he was in Russia and came, like, the signing came together in like three weeks. Like, it was like, Anyway, uh, you know, it was... It, you get More of a mystery of why you were able to get him, right? Yes, yes, honestly. I mean, right. I mean like, why wouldn't really... Uh, and again, it's almost always the same, which is the selling club needs the money. And, and uh, hopefully we are, you know, responsible in planning, and that never happens to us. Um, but yes, there's more often there is disagreement about a target, and you have to weigh the relative stuff. And look, and one of the things that, that I have to do in my job, too, is to say, I mean, Earlier in my career, I scouted. I mean, that's what I did. You know, when, when we had, when we were in Salt Lake, we had 11 people total, and that was it. In Saunders, we have 50. Um, so it's a different scope and a different scale, and I'm not staying up all night watching video of guys at this point. But 
Um, you do have to have a sanity check in my role as to, you know, as, is this the right guy scouting wise? You do need to know enough about analytics. And, you know, Robbie would stress that um, what you really have to do is you have to know the proper questions to ask the analysts because only the analysts truly understand the analytics and the analytics can be misused very easily and data can be misused. Um, but if you can do all that and then, you know, talk to the coaching staff and say stylistically from a player profile, does this look like somebody that you will be successful with? I think it's, it's putting together its own kind of a soup and, you know, you, and you put it together and you hope it comes out and tastes good. So um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll ask before getting into the uh, – it looks like we might only have one question. So uh, That means I really talk too much. It, no, it means that you, you just – I think it was – I asked you the right question. <laughs> uh, Other people are really bored after three hours of this. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. Are you? Are you guys bored? No. Uh, all right. All right. All right. See? We can pass a mic out there. That'd be I mean, fun. the mic's there's a yeah. mic up here. You guys want to come up? Uh, we got we got we got about five more minutes. If there's if people want to ask questions, it sounds yeah, like. No, I I'll, 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 I'll stay longer than five minutes. Okay, okay. So let me just ask you this one, right. and then what do you see as the next like uh, frontier for MLS signings? Like it looks like Brazil is maybe opening up. What? But what are the what's the player look like who's signing in MLS in five years? In five years, with this young player initiative, if we begin systemically attracting young European prospects, that would be the next kind of Rubicon to cross. I think we've persuaded anyone in South America right now that MLS is cool. Um, we've gotten good players from Europe, but we haven't yet gotten you know, kids that still have a chance, that are still breaking into national teams in Europe and things like that. And, I think that's maybe that, that final frontier. Now, I honestly wouldn't spend a lot of time and heartache worrying about are we going to do, are we going to get there, is it going to happen? With the amount of investment in MLS and the end of the new CBA and stability for five years, and you look at what people are paying for franchises, you know, if you pay $325 million for the Charlotte franchise, that's a different ballgame. Like, you, the, 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 you know, what you're going to see Miami spend this year, well, you're going to see some of these teams coming in. It's going to, it's going to raise, you know, that, that tide's going to rise on, raise on the boats. And I think MLS is going to get better and better and better. It's, it's, a, it's been a fun place to work for the last 12 years and hopefully continue to be. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Garth. So we are going to take a few questions. I can't promise that we're going to spend a whole bunch of time. We do have a deadline to get out of here. Oh, boy. But so uh, introduce yourself and ask the question. You know, I got asked this question today in a different way. And uh, <laughs> it was this, you know, does Tommy have a magic wand? Because literally anyone who trains with Tommy, he's like, he's Mr. Miyagi now, right? Like, you, you just go out, someone, he's like, oh, he's the next starter. Tyler Miller, boom, LAFC. Uh, Brian Meredith, boom, uh, you know, expansion draft. I, I don't get totally surprised that often anymore. When Brian Meredith was taken in the expansion draft, I, I was like, I did not see that coming. He did we! Yeah, and that is all time in neutral. I mean, that is, I mean, there's just, they're just not a lot of data on Brian Meredith. He hasn't played a lot of games. And so I thought we were the only guys that knew how good Brian Meredith was. Uh, and of course, we have Kurt Spitz with Miami, and that's part of the, the explanation there. But um, Tommy's been absolutely amazing, and we've given him two good young goalkeepers and Steph Cleveland and Trey Hughes, and, you know, he, you know, his, his relationship with Steph Fry is special, period, full stop. Steph's a pretty special individual as a, as a human. Um, and we're really lucky to have him. But one of the things that we got to manage this year is we, if, we, if we play 45 or 50 games, we got to make sure Steph Fry does not play 45 or 50 games. we, we got to see if we can extend his career. Um, and look, and that means playing our young goalkeepers. And that means that we may see a mistake or two. That's what happens with young goalkeepers. And, you know, I think it's going to be really important, you know, even at a fan base level, that we rally around this and we see this kind of big picture and we say, hey, we understand we're getting better and for the long haul, this is the way to do it because we may get five more years of step pride 
if we get 10 games to stop Cleveland and Trey Hughes this year. So. Sometimes we go in there, we're like, whoop, we're gonna <laughs> hand them right back to mama and we'll, we'll come back after the game. But um, no karaoke in the locker room, but it's, it comes, it's a lot of multicultural music and you can kind of tell who's in the ascendancy based on if it's salsa or if it's merengue or if it's, you know, rap or whatever's going on. So, good question. Wayne Weber, by the way, the best karaoke singer on, on the staff. I mean, if you, if you guys haven't go seen him, he, he, he does karaoke regularly down in uh, Tacoma. He's, the, he's a federal playboy, so he goes down there around uh, the Defiance games and you can usually catch him uh, on the mic. Do you know, do you know, I, we, we'll no, find out. Uh, we'll, we'll get this out to you. I don't know about that. Right <laughs> Stack the four trophies, so Open Cup, Supporter Shield, uh, Champions League, Campione's Cup, MLS Cups, there's five. <laughs> Look, yeah. Okay, sorry. Cascadia, there you go. Six Cups. Look, I've said we, we kind of have three seasons. So we our first season is Champions League season. Then we have Lose All Our Players season because we have Copa America and, and you know, Euros. And, you know, the only guys we could possibly lose are Ladero, Rui, Diaz, Ariaga, and Svensson right down the spine of our team. Yeah. What could Other than that. Wrong? Um, and then we have the stretch run season, which you guys have come to know and love. But, but truly, like, like this year, at least, at least look me in the eye now, Jeremiah, when, when you asked me in July, Garth, is it finally coming together? At least tell you, I told you before the season, like, it's kind of predictable when you lose all your good players for two months, and then you get them all back, that, that, then you're better. Yeah, so, you uh, have said that before, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, so... Man, I, I think it's hard. And what the honest answer to this with the six cups is it, it honestly changes based on where you are in the season. It has to, the answer to that has to be Champions League right now. There, you know, and literally, no one else has done it. We do that. It puts us on a different page. But there's a huge difference. If we go, if we flame out on Thursday and we go out in the first round of the Champions League, then that honestly impacts how we approach the regular season and, and Open Cup, for example. Because those are the next two ones that. Thing. It puts probably a little bit more emphasis on Campione's Cup because if we want to be a big boy league, we got to beat teams in Central America. And you know, hopefully, hopefully we don't get to this point. You know, we're able to win on Thursday and push through and push on for a couple more rounds. And if you have a really good showing in Champions League, honestly, that dictates Open Cup probably the other way because if nothing else, you're just going to have to play young players because you're, again, you can't play you can't pay, play Svensson 40 games either, and you honestly don't want to play Ladero 40 games. You know, part of the thing that we've, we've seen always is, again, the key to that stretch run at the end of the season is we've gotten healthy. You get healthy by rotating your squad. And so that means different points of emphasis for different tournaments. And it doesn't mean we don't care about the Open Cup. It doesn't mean that we don't think our kids can win that. Because if we do our development right, they can eventually win that tournament. Um, but it's balancing all these things over the course of the season and it's given good performances, I think, across all fronts. And, um, you know, and, and it's, Ultimately, looking at things like if you don't win Champions League, okay, but you go for MLS Cup. I and mean, if you win another MLS Cup, then you can start throwing a D word around, right? I mean, then, then, then you go back to back, you got, you got four or five, you know, like, or sorry, three or five. You know, that's, that's, that's historic then, right? And coming off being 18 of the decade, you know, those are the mountains left to conquer. But anyway, right now it's Champions League. We're going to go try to get it. Um, it's really hard. Uh, but eventually somebody's got to do it, right? So, uh, may as well be us. Yeah, Look at us. Yeah. Look at us. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to just say thank you for helping bring two MLS Cups to Seattle. That's been awesome. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank, thank, thank yourselves. You're clapping for yourselves right now. Uh, second, I would just like to also extend thank you for being the first MLS team to be carbon neutral in all of MLS. Thank you for your work with the Green Walmart River. Thank you for the Duwamish people that we are, you know, being part of this land. Thank you for that. Uh, and so I would just like to just ask, you know, what does it mean for day-to-day -day operations? What does it mean for the club to be carbon neutral? And, you know, what kind of precedent does that set for the MLS and for other clubs in the world? Look, I, I think you always want to try to be a leader, right? And you want to reflect the values of your community. And in order to be a sports team anywhere in any city, um, and I'm really proud of this. We are really proud of being carbon neutral. We're also really proud of pride. I mean, I don't know if we were actually the first club to do pride, but we were definitely one of the very first. Um, and I remember we got the very first one we did, we got some nasty phone calls saying, you know, this isn't something that I want to be part of. And we just said, we got to push on. This is, this is, we want to be on the right side of history here. This thing is going to grow, it's going to develop. kids game, playing a kids game, you know, I do fantasy sports for a living, right? That's, that's what my job is. But the chance to make a difference is, is what's worthwhile, right? That, that gives life meaning and value and, and hopefully leaving the world a better place, both from an environmental perspective and from a social one, is something that is certainly something we hope we're a part of, but it, it also is very much reflective of Seattle. And for someone like me who's moved here, who's moved a lot of different places and moved here, that's a really cool part of living here and, and being around people that embrace it. Because again, it's a kind of thing, I don't know how much noise it makes to be carbon neutral in Chicago where I grew up. You know, I, I think, but I think it's a big deal here. And if it's a big deal here, then we can kind of show the rest of the world, like we can be a trendsetter. We can use this to launch a World Cup in, you know, to be a host city. Um, and I think that'd be massive to put Seattle on the map. And I think it's something we should all aspire for. And I do think carbon neutrality, particularly in a world where our country is unfortunately pulled out of the Paris Accord, is a huge step to say, we in Seattle don't believe that. We, to the contrary, we're working to have All I have to do now is talk about religion. We'll hit all the uh, right. all nonsense and topics. Do we have one more, one more question or? Uh... Go for it, man. Okay. Hey, um, first, I'd just like to say thanks to the Sounders organization for just coming out and doing this sort of thing. It's great to have actually people from the team be able to just come out and just be able to talk to you. I mean, any other league in the world that we can actually come and talk to the general manager of soccer operations and say, what is the team doing? It, it's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Likewise, it's pretty cool for me to come and feel pretty comfortable and pretty accepted and, and you know, to be part of something like this because, you know, it, it's been, you said, four or five years now, yeah, right? Yeah. And this is, like, I really want to congratulate all you. This is a cool event. Like, I was looking forward to this. Like, before you called me, I was like, when's Yacht Like, we had to, we had to, we had to, I had to come out and do this again. So, it's, it really is, like, it is, like, the job is the job and the job's a lot of pressure and there's a ton of stress, but, like, when you folks come, when you guys come up and say hello and you say, how you doing, man? And you say, thank you. I'm like, first of all, it's ridiculous that you're thanking me for anything, but it, you guys are the backbone of the team. But still, it means a lot to me. Uh, it really does. Um, you know, if you come up and say, hey, Garth, on the street, it, 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 I really appreciate that. And um, hopefully it's not followed by a, a, a stiff uppercut or anything like that. <laughs> um, stiff, a stiff, witty remark is always welcome. But, uh, you know, it, it's uh, the best one that I've had so far was uh, after we won the first time, a gentleman came up at the Zach Scott testimonial game and said, uh, thank you for bringing joy to the city. And I thought, that was, this is life, this is amazing, right? Like, it's really incredible. So I called my brother, excuse me, this can be an example of the, the way I grew up and how maybe we stay humble in our family. Uh, and he said, and I said, can you believe this? This guy who doesn't know me just walked up to me and said, you know, thank you for bringing joy to the city. And he's like, oh, did you shave today? And I'm like, no. <laughs> He must have thought you were Santa Claus. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I didn't mean to railroad your question there, but it's it's great to be here. So on a later question, um, my cousin's from Portland. So so is Jeremiah. <laughs> he lived there briefly. Did I at least get that part right? No, there was not a Portland face. No, my cousin lives there. Cousin lives there. So right, so you. Your cousin's friends? No, maybe. 
Hey, hey, Matt Pence writes about Portland now, too. Yeah. So you should boo him, too. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Keep in mind, everyone on the Portland staff worked for me at one time or another at this point, too. So. It's not literally true. Go on. You just give me a shovel next time. I'll just keep digging and digging and all right. He is then living overseas, and I told him congratulations on Portland making it to the League Cup, and he had no idea what that was. And so I described it as feedback. The cup for teams that are good enough to make the playoff but don't win anything. <laughs> yeah, you can. I mean, you can say you just aren't as good as Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, I will actually go unsnarky here and say uh, the League's Cup actually is pretty cool. It's, it's something that could be, <laughs> fair enough, but <laughs> counterpoint in, up front here. Um, it, it's, it's not been cool yet, but it could be. Here's what I mean. If, if you, the, the games that are, that are the highest rated, that people get the most fired up about for the most part, is when we play Mexican teams, right? Whether that's in Champions League, whether that's the national team. Um, if you look at the television ratings in the United States, uh, more people still watch big league MX games and watch uh, big MLS games. But clearly and obviously, uniting those tribes is the way to drive soccer forward in this country, right? I mean, imagine a world in which you have an English language rights deal and a Spanish language rights deal in both Mexico and the United States and in Canada. That's a lot of money. Um, and the significance of that is that then brings lots of really good players into uh, that league. And so what the League's Cup is the kind of first seeds of or the germination of potentially is some type of long term. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what anybody knows what it's going to look like. Partnership or collaboration between Liga MX and MLS. And that is really, really exciting because that's the next, that can be the next big thing, right? Some of the big ideas out there, do you combine CONCACAF and CONMEBOL and take on UEFA that way and stuff? And there's a ton of, you know, Copa America Centenario here in Seattle and over the US was an amazingly, hugely successful event, but there's just tons of bureaucratic and political issues with that. You know, when we have a shared border, and now we now have, I think, literally half a dozen big Mexican players that, we all, that were signed by MLS this year that are going to come over and play at MLS, You're, this is happening. Like, this is, the world is getting smaller, these leagues are getting closer, and I think that's the promise or the hope, maybe, of Leagues Cup, that these can become potentially even meaningful games that count in the standings at some point in the future um, for both leagues in both countries. And that could be a really, really cool thing, because Champions League, Look, we're going to go for it. We're going to give it our all. The way at the time of year it is, it is really difficult to ramp up so quickly to get 90 minutes fit and then to try to take on Mexican teams. Now, we got, we've got a little bit better runway. We don't draw a Mexican team until April 7. You know, famous last words. By, by just by uttering these words, we're going to lose to a Canadian team or a Central American team. But, uh, you know, <laughs> if you make it to the Mexican team, you got some time. To say you got to be fit, top fit by April, that's, that's at least achievable. To say you're going to be top fit by February 27 when you play Lyon, as LAFC got, you're, you're hoping and wishing a little bit. So, you know, this idea of systematically playing the Mexicans, it'll certainly make us better. Um, and that's what I think we all want, right? We all want the league to grow and improve and put ourselves in position, hopefully to capitalize on the next television contract, which would start in 2023, but also then to hopefully host a World Cup and, and really use that as the boomerang or the, the spring to, to become one of the truly the best leagues in the world. And that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we aspire to do. Um, and that's where, that's where you guys come in again because when we tell people we are the 30th, we have, we have the 30th largest crowd in the world, people still don't believe me. They, they, like players don't believe me. Agents are like, yeah, yeah. And we just, we send them, we got a little two minute video. We said, just, just stick it, just here you go, here's a little file. And they watch it. And they they can't. Like people can't believe it. Like and that's what's so cool. Like when I come to come to see you guys, and you know we do it once a year and stuff. And just please take a moment when you're <coughs> with your friends or at the first game or whatever, and just like give yourselves a high five, man. It is it is absolutely amazing what y'all do. Um, it is incredible the energy you bring and the amount of support that we have, not just as players and staffers and all that, but what the world sees for Seattle. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Well, with
with that, that's probably a good place to uh, to call it an event. Um, hey. So uh, I just wanted to make sure to remind everyone to settle up with uh, with the auction and and all that kind of stuff. I I feel like this was a very uh, good event. I wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, I did want to also just kind of thank some people that made this possible. I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Garth, thank Brad, thank Will, thank Jess, Bethany, uh, Bill, for coming out here. And this is really, I, I mean, and Schmetz, of course, Schmetz. And I mean, it's, I don't think that there's anything like this going on in, in the United States, probably. I, I don't know that there's anything going on like this in the world where, like, Big time athletes and heads of organizations are coming to a fan event and just kind of taking questions from the crowd and uh, hanging out and doing this whole thing. Thanks to the Sounders for, for being good uh, good partners in this thing, I guess. Well, we're gonna, I'm gonna dub you guys partners in that. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Sammy, also. <laughs> thank you to ECS for bringing the Cascadia Cup. Um, I, I also I really want to thank uh, Lickett and Aaron uh, for for kind of sticking with us on the making this happen behind the scenes. Um, I don't think I could say um, clearly enough that Emily Cummings uh, puts in a ton of work behind the scenes. She's turned this from she's literally behind the scenes, I guess, right now. But uh, I mean, she's really taken this front to a different level, huh? Oh, there she's in the back there. Uh, I I want to say thank you to SB Nation and Sounder Art for for actually helping fund it this year, which was awesome. Uh, thanks to my fellow presenters Susie Rance and Jacob Cristobal for putting on a really great uh, rain segment. Uh, thanks to Tim Foss uh, for for helping out uh, with the with modeling and with hosting the game. Thanks to Beth Mantle for also uh, being a model and. Uh, and helping out also behind the scenes. There is so, like, this is really a volunteer run organization. It's kind of, I mean, event, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, Dave Clark helped out today, Kelly Stevens, Ben Harrison, Steve Vogt, uh, Andrew Beck, Giovanna O'Shan, and Marnie O'Shan, who I, I really wanted to thank uh, since they're related to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to thank uh, our sponsors, Full Pull Wines. Uh, everyone that donated stuff, James Woolard, John Cam Johnny Campbell, Johnny Football, as you may know, uh, Jane Gershevich, uh, The Masonry, KXP, Matt Pence. Um, and finally, I want to say thanks to Hales Palladium for hosting us. Uh, I really think that this was a, uh, our, I'd like to think it's our best event and uh, hope to be doing this again uh, next year. Um, and that's it. So thank you. Give yourselves an applause too. See you Thursday. And, and Sunday. And apparently we raised twelve thousand dollars. Well, that is well done. That's unbelievable. The extra two thousand is a suit. Yes. Sign. Did you sign it for him? Absolutely. <laughs>